And there are times when we probably go through the process without stopping to think about what was what this really represents. Because you and I know, of course, this is a symbol. This is not the, the blood of Christ. It is not the body of Jesus. It is symbols reminding us, calling us to remember the incredible transaction that happened 2,000 years ago. And so Jesus, when he was revealing his will to Paul, and it's so interesting, the, the 23rd chapter of, of the, the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul makes it clear that, that what he is writing to them, beginning in the 23rd verse in particular, is something that he received from the Lord. Notice that. He had not received it from the disciples in Jerusalem, although he had visited Jerusalem. He had got to meet Peter, James, John, and the other disciples. But he had not received this particular instruction from them. He received it from the Lord. That is significant for us to understand as we look at what's happening here. This is not something the church thought would be a good idea. This is not something that a religious denomination felt was a nice little gimmick to help people once in a while to remember Jesus' death. This, in fact, is of such importance that the Lord showed it to Paul, and Paul would write the incredible volumes of the New Testament that are spoken to the church down through the last 2,000 years. And so Paul would say in the 23rd verse, I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Underline that, please. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament. This is the New Covenant. You, you who have been with us a long time remember the extensive teaching I did on the new covenant uh, covenant living some, some a couple, three, maybe four years ago this cup is the new testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me underline that, notice that's twice there wherefore as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup you do show the Lord's death till he come you see, for Paul writing, the communion was not just a, a thing that the believers did. It was not just a, 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 a thing that they came together and, and celebrated once or, or periodically or in a systematic way. It was much more than that. For Paul, you see, the communion table was a proclamation. It was a proclamation of the grace of God. It was a proclamation of the love of God. It was a proclamation that Jesus indeed came and died and rose again. It was more than a proclamation. It was a declaration. It was a declaration that the sin question had finally been settled. It was a declaration that the Old Testament sacrificial system was now no longer necessary because it could not take away sin. But now that Jesus died and rose again, now he was declaring that the sin question has been, this, has been answered by the grace of God. In fact, Paul would go so far, I believe, to say that the communion time was a literal preaching of Christ. Of Christ. How many people today come and, 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 and out of habit and out of ritual and routine, they receive the, the wine and the a body and they never take one second to remember what this all means. Paul said, this do in remembrance of me as he repeated what Jesus gave him. And I, I, my personal opinion is that he gave it to him while he was in Arabia. We won't go there, but sometimes I may, I may share with you what I believe Paul was showing in those three years in Arabia. They are incredible things. Jesus said in the 24th verse, this do in remembrance of me. In the 25th verse, he said, in remembrance of me. In remembrance of me. What does he want us to remember? What does he want us to remember? You see, carved in the communion tables at the front of a of 10,000 churches and more across our nation and around our world is this incredible statement, this do in remembrance of me. 
And we see it there sometimes, and we we one we just read it and just without giving it a second thought, this just our mind at all. But you see, Jesus said, "This do in remembrance of me." It's an incredible statement, isn't it? I suppose what we're going to ask this question is, what does Christ want us to remember? He just said, this do in remembrance of me. What does he want us to remember? What divine truths are declared by the communion table as it sets before us tonight? It is a silent witness of our worship. It is a silent witness of our activity. What, what does it want us to remember? What are the statements that these emblems are making to us? I believe that clearly Christ wants us to remember his victory, which is also our victory. God wants us to understand that the, the defeat of sin at the cross was a defeat for sin and a victory for mankind. When Jesus rose again and the angel said to the, woman, uh, to, to the women, Why seek ye the living amongst the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Go tell. It was the same message that I'm sharing tonight, that there is victory in the cross. Amen. There is victory in, 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 in the communion table. There is victory in what we remember. You see, the Lord's death is not an expression of defeat. It is a great victory. Yes, we feel the pain on Good Friday. Yes, we feel the sorrow on Saturday. But we also feel the victory and the joy that comes on Sunday morning when the word goes out, He is not here, for He is risen. Somebody give the Lord praise. Amen. That's what the communion table says to us. Jesus said, do it in remembrance of me. And do it till I come. You see, in in the statement of the communion table of night, it says that in death, Jesus destroyed death. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? But the word of God in Hebrews tells us that he came to destroy the devil and the works of the devil and to destroy death. That is the reason why the child of God is not afraid of death. Oh, we're not excited about dying per se particularly in the prime of our days. We want to see our children and our grandchildren grow up. We want to see and experience all that life gives us. But when it comes down to death being the end, that is gone because of the victory of the cross. The communion table is a reminder that Jesus Christ conquered death. Amen. And in conquering death, he made you and I the recipients of eternal life as we believe upon him. You see, the cross is the God-given key to life. You will notice today that, that, that many, many, many churches and many, many preachers no longer have room for the cross of Christ. They no longer have no, any room for the blood of Jesus Christ. But you see, the blood and the cross is the, is the key to life that was given to us by God Almighty. See, Paul undoubtedly taught the Corinthians that the Lord too was an occasion for remembering the triumph of the cross. Tonight when we gather around the communion of the Lord, we're going to remember the triumph of the cross. You say, Pastor, how can the cross be a place of triumph when it was such a place of pain? How could the cross be a place of triumph when it seems like the Romans and the Jews had declared victory over this Nazarene, this, this crackpot who for the last three years or so have been raising all kinds of problems for them in the environment around Jerusalem and in Israel. How could that be so? It's so because Easter Sunday comes and the grave is empty. Amen. It's so because the cross speaks to us of the of the of the of victory and triumph, not defeat and devastation. It also speaks to us of the power of the provision of the cross. Amen. The power of the provision of the cross. There is healing in the cross. There is salvation in the cross. There is deliverance in the cross. And so the communion table says there is a power in the provisions of the cross and it's never run down. Amen. It's not solar activated. It's not hydro activated. It's not wisdom activated of men. It is the plan of God. Amen. And the provisions of the cross is power unto all who would dare to believe. Paul would write to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God and the salvation unto everyone who believes. What gospel? The gospel of the cross of Christ. Amen. The cross of Christ that stood there as a reproach, but God turned it to be the greatest 
victory of the ages. Amen. That's the communion table. See, Jesus knew that we'd never have the cross before us. He knew that we would, that his, his gospel would filter down through the generations and through the decades and through the millennium. And he knew that we would be far removed from all that unfolded in Jerusalem. And so he said, hey, I want you to do this. Now we do it like this. Others would do it a little differently. We call it the Lord's Supper. Some call it the Eucharist. Some call it the Communion. Some call it different names. But the truth of it is the meaning that's behind it. That the cross conquered death. The power of its provisions sets men and women free from bondage. And that the joy of its provision is our hope. Amen. What did Paul say? I will glory in the cross. I want glory in my great pharisaical training. I want glory in the fact that I sat at the feet of Gammy Hill and learned from the greatest rabbi of his day. I want glory in those things. I will glory in the cross. Amen. I will glory in the blood of Jesus. I will glory in the one who arrested me on the road to Damascus, who showed himself as Lord, and I sold myself to him. I will glory in the cross of Jesus. Amen. Oh, bring back the cross in our churches. Bring back the cross in our preaching. Bring back the cross in our lives. Therefore, the communion service must become a celebration focusing on what Jesus finished for us at Calvary. And my emphasis is on finished. Thank God for good works, but good works don't cut it. Thank God for great deeds, but great deeds don't save us. The finished work of Calvary, because of the death and resurrection of Christ, clearly says that he who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. He who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not he who does great things and gets written up in history. Not he who does great things and the church recognizes these great works, which is all wonderful. They are not saving things. There's only one way. is the cross. It's the finished work. The community becomes an occasion where we proclaim the good news of the gospel that Jesus called his purpose. You'll quickly look into Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Jesus said his purpose was this, was this, that he had been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the message of the communion. Amen. This is the message of the communion that we carry forward the purpose and passion of Christ to declare hope to the hopeless and life to the dead and, and peace to the troubled. That's what the communion table is all about. It's not about us just coming here and totally resting and waiting for it to happen again. It's about us having an encounter with God through the resurrected Christ in remembrance of His power and His anointing and to go forth and tell our community that Jesus is alive. To a pastor, is that okay? Yes, it's okay. Every turn, time I turn around, someone's trying to give me a different message. And they proudly proclaim what I would declare to be complete falsities. And take pride and joy in it. So why can't you and I stand up and say, let me tell you the truth. Let me declare unto you that Jesus Christ is alive. That he heals the broken on it. He saves the sinner. He restores the broken. He brings peace where there's war. He brings joy where there is fear. He brings deliverance where there is bondage. That's Jesus. Amen. That's the whole purpose of the communion table. If we just come and take it and go away and never remember it again, we have done a great disservice to the work of Christ and to our own personal walk with God. We must remember that the communion table speaks to us of these tremendous truths. If Jesus were physically present with us today, he would want us to remember what he has secured for us. I think he would constantly, as he told the disciples, remind us of what he's done for us. You see, he wants us to enjoy every benefit of forgiveness. I thought our brother this morning, our visiting brother this morning, touched upon and shared a tremendous principle that there is incredible release and new life when we give forgiveness to people. 
and we have been forgiven. And therefore we must forgive as we have been forgiven. And when we realize that because we have been forgiven, we have the incredible benefit of peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think Christ would remind us tonight if you were here that we are to enjoy the benefits of forgiveness. That we are to receive every provision of victory. I want you to know tonight that this, this, these emblems here speak to us clearly. That we don't need to live in bondage. But one has gone before us who sets the prisoner free. And you and I have life in Christ Jesus. Amen. It's not just a, 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 a wafer. And it's not just a great juice. It, it speaks to us of the truth behind it that Jesus Christ has set us free. Amen. We are forgiven. We are set free. We have every provision necessary for victory. You see, if the devil can get you and I to, 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 to lose our victory, if he can get you and I to become ambassadors of disappointment and discouragement and frustration, we are going to perpetrate that to others. Jesus has called us to live in the victory of the cross. Amen. When I stand at this table tonight, I am reminded that I have victory in Jesus Christ. Remember the old song, Victory in Jesus. My Savior forever, He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me here, I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. See, Satan don't want you and I to come to victory. You know the reason why? Because this world is a bondage. And if you will take a moment to get to know some people, you'll just begin to discover how much bondage they're in. Amen. You walk into their lives and there's victory in your life and there's hope in your life and there's joy in your voice and there's, there's a sparkle in your eye. It ain't going to take long before they'll say, what makes you different? Right. Now that's like saying, sick them to a dog. <laughs> Amen. Once they ask what makes you different, you have every right to say, I live in the victory of the cross of Jesus Christ. Oh, Amen. Amen. And so when I stand at this table, I'm reminded that I have victory in Jesus. Now, Pastor, you say you don't have any struggles? Plenty. You, you say that you don't have any, any, anything to maybe throw you out of sorts? Plenty. At the end of the day, I know I live in victory. Amen. Amen. I live in victory. Why? Because of the cross. Amen. I think it's significant that we do this on a routine basis, not once a year, not twice a year, but we set aside every Sunday night of the first Sunday night of each month and we try as much as possible because this exercise has something to say to us. Amen. This is not just, oh, I think I'm going to take communion because I believe as a Christian I'm supposed to take communion and if I don't take communion, I may be misunderstood, so I've got to go to church. <laughs> if you're coming like that, you might choke on your way for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my friends. The communion time is a time to remember Amen. that we have victory in Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. I say to people sometimes who, who talk about their defeat, who talk about their struggles, I like to tell them, get out to the body of Christ. Get where the body of Christ is. Come out where victory is, amen, where people live in God's victory. Come on out and, and be part of what God is doing, amen. amen. Say, no, I, the truth is, he wants, Jesus wants us to receive every provision of our victory. He wants us to enter into every freedom from every point of bondage. There's a lot of Christians living in, in bondage at some level. Fear and intimidation and, 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 and all of these things only serve to take away the joy of the Lord. But the communion table says that we have a freedom, amen, from every bondage that will hold us or bind us. Amen. You understand? The freedom that was in Christ when he said to the disciples, this is my body, this is my blood, which is given for you. This do in remembrance. He was unshackled from fear. He was unshackled from personal ambition. He was unshackled from the self-focus so that he might live free from every bondage to serve. Amen. God wants us to live the same way. 
Jesus wants us to partake of his healing presence and his power. I believe as we gather around the table of the Lord, and for years we've been doing this, we also take time to pray with one another. We have seen God do tremendous work in the lives of people as we've shared the communion together and, 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 and walked as a family with each other in our sorrows and our struggles and our sicknesses and our diseases and our challenges. And we've seen God bring healing to different situations and strengthen the believer. Why? Because the message of the communion table, the truth of the communion table, is that we can partake of the healing presence and power of Jesus Christ. For he said, by his stripes we're healed. Folk, that means more than our spiritual healing from sin. It means physical healing for our bodies. It's incredible, isn't it? But if you look closely at the, at the truths of the communion table, you link it immediately with Psalms 23, verse 5. It says, Our great shepherd has prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Thou preparest a table for me, David said. We know he was speaking prophetically. As we come to the table of the Lord, it is a table of God's provision. And no matter what the enemy is doing around us, no matter what the culture is doing around us, no matter what the society is doing around us, and no matter how much we are mocked or scoffed for being biblical Christians. Isn't that funny? I'm a Christian now, I don't believe in the Bible. I'm a Christian, but I don't believe that we need to uh, have the blood of Christ applied to our life. I'm a Christian, but I don't want to hear about the cross. I'm a Christian, but don't talk to me about the second coming of Jesus. It's amazing how many people want to be Christians without knowing Christ or following the Word of God. You see, we live in an hostile world. But David said, that because of Christ, we have a table set for us in the presence of our enemies. And the result is that our cup runs over. Yeah? What does divine truth, what does Christ want remembered at his table? Well, I, I kind of enjoy memorials. I don't go looking for them by the mind. In downtown Toronto, I see a picture of a historical figure uh, in Boston on a great bronze plaque, or uh, maybe at the entrance to a park. You know, I'm talking about. I take a moment to go and read. What What did this guy do to 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 deserve this kind of recognition, this kind of of of, of plaque? What did he do to have a park? Uh, called after his name. What did he do that, that made me stop and want to see what he done? So I began to read. I began to, the last one I really read was uh, about uh, um, Sir Winston Churchill. No, no relation to Brother Don Churchill, I'm sure. <laughs> I began to read how he came to Toronto, how he did this, how he did that, how he brought a great uh, camaraderie between the Canadian leadership and the British leadership and how he, uh, of course, the significant role that he played in the in the Second World War and all of those wonderful things. And I thought, he's got a plaque there because he had some achievements. He's got written up because he did some things. I want you to know something today. That Jesus wants us to remember at his table the great things and achievements that he accomplished for us at the cross. Amen. Amen. And so while I said, this table says no words, and these brass or whatever it is, cheap material, whatever it is there, that, that the containers that the bread and the, and, and, and the juices in, they're not saying a word. Yet what they represent speaks of God. Speaks of God. What did Jesus achieve for you and I? What is all of this about? Number one, I believe he wants us to remember that we are fully justified. I can't even go there tonight. This is the subject for a full years of preaching. How we have been justified. Notice, we have not been excused for our sin. 
The Bible doesn't say that we have to be excused, that God looked up their way. It's only human beings, so they're going to have up days, down days. They're going to be in, they're going to be out. They're going to be days when they're good, they're going to be days when they're bad. I'm just going to turn a blind eye to them. I'm just kind of going to excuse them because they're human. Didn't do that. You sent Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on Calvary, paid the full penalty so that you and I, when we believe on him, could be justified. Not excused, justified. Say it real slow, just as if I had never seen it. Wow. Because you and I embraced the cross and the truths of the communion table and the death and resurrection of Christ and what he accomplished when he said it is finished, you and I are justified. I can't explain it. Guilty? Yes. But in the divine work of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, he sees us as just as if we've never sinned. There is no sin on your record in the annals of God. Heaven's records and books. You say, how can that be? How can how come the devil remembers how what I did? How come he makes me remember what I did? And when I go to God, he can't remember. How'd that happen? Because he sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're justified. So when Satan says, but God, he, he did that, and God says, I have no idea what you're talking about. You say, is God blind? No. He sees us through the blood of His Son, amen, and we are justified by the cross. And so this communion tells me that this Baxton Pentecostal boy who ran from God, who ran from a praying mom and a praying dad, who dabbled in things he should have never done and finally got a little bit of sense and heard the voice of the Holy Spirit and one night bowed before God and God forgave him completely. Now don't you tell my family when I'm sinless. Don't you tell my family that I've never sinned, because they know more than God knows. <laughs> Isn't that true, though? Isn't that true? I, I, I know more about you than God knows. I know about when you sin, and I talk to God about it, and it says, it's clean, it's clean. You're justified. As if you'd never sinned. That's the achievement of the cross. That's what this speaks to us. That the achievement of the cross is that you and I are justified by the death and the resurrection and the blood of Christ and the cross of Christ. And now before Almighty God, because we have received Christ as Lord by faith, we're justified. Amen. We need to talk about it more. We need to embrace it more. We need to sit alone in God's presence more often and say, God, I don't understand this. I know who I am. I know how bad I've been. I know how uh, the tendencies I have. And yet in your presence, Lord, you see me as pure and clean and never sin. Oh. That's quite an achievement. Wouldn't you say? Some of you guys, I looked down there tonight and you were rascals. You were blasphemers. You were you were alcoholics. You were perverts. Yes, you were. Some of you were perverts. And some of you were alcoholics. And some of you were pushy drugs. And some of you were, were involved with things that, that it's, 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 not, it's not lawful to mention. And the night you're sitting here, raising your hands and singing on the Lord. Amen. How can that be? How could that be? Because of justification. Yes. How? Jesus achieved justification for us. The second thing he did achieved for us, right? I can't give you all the things, but full dominion over all the powers of hell. Look up in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 to 23. Paul talks about that power that's in you through the resurrected Christ. Amen. A power that supersedes the powers of darkness. He accomplished for us full availability of healing for every dimension of our being, emotional, physical, psychological, and spiritual healing comes from the cross of Christ. Amen. Amen. So the great list of accomplishments of the cross that was set under the name of Jesus are these and many more. That's what the communion table says. You say, Pastor, you're pretty dogmatic tonight. I want to be dogmatic tonight. I never want you to take another, participate in another communion service, but what you remember, what it's saying to you. Amen. 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 
That you hear the voice of Jesus speaking His grace, His mercy, His love, and His call to His discipleship upon your life. You see, I, I've seen I've seen people come to take communion, and they just let me just use a real good East Coast word. They just swore along. <laughs> They just so nonchalantly smiling, talking to their friends, and just carrying on. They come to the wafer, they take it, they eat it, they look at it, they eat it, they think it's funny. And then they come to the juice, and they observe it for a second, and they drink it, look at their friend, and kind of smile. Isn't this neat now? I tell you, that makes me mad. I don't want to know something. Your pastor gets mad. There are some things I reserve the right to get mad at. Okay. And that's one of them. Because we're to come to the table of the Lord, not lightly, not ignorantly, not with a lack of reverence, but an incredible reverence for what this speaks to us. Because of this, I am forgiven. Because of this, I have power over darkness. Because of this, I have healing in my mind, my spirit, my body, my thoughts, and, and, in, and psychologically and in every way. This is because of the incredible death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's no wonder Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. See, he didn't mean for us to just think of, oh, what a great guy. What a great guy. 2,000 years ago, he did this for me. What a great guy. That's not what he meant. He meant, remember what this accomplished. Remember what this symbolized. He also wants us to remember that the full experience of God's love releases us to love and to lead us to peace and unity in all of our relationships. That's the reason why born-again believers who love Christ and understand the work of Calvary are the best people in the world to be around. See, a contrary Christian is an oxymoron. Yes, sir. I see nowhere in the New Testament where Jesus was ever contrary. I saw him mad. I saw him demanding. I saw him broken, but never contrary. And don't blame it on your grandfather. <laughs> now, my grandfather was like, that's so I'm like it too. If you're washed in the blood of Jesus and born again and walking in the Spirit, then you don't need to be contrary either. Right. Amen. 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 I remember what Jesus did at the cross in all of our relationships. We are to remember what Jesus did. Therefore, we come to the table of the Lord with thanksgiving in praise and worship. Amen. When we come to the table of the Lord, we come with reverence and with praise and worship and thanksgiving for the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, the table of the Lord, and I'm getting towards my end, the table of the Lord tells us that it is finished. Amen. This is not something I've got to do to make sure I'm right with God. This reminds me that the finished work of Calvary is finished. And I can I participate in this out of appreciation, out of remembering what the Lord done for me. See this great word cry, it is finished. And that's what the cross the centuries, it, 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 it's rumbled down the corridors of hell. It's it, 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 it breezed through the ramparts of heaven. And this one question, this one question is answered. Jesus is both Lord and conqueror. He is Lord and conqueror. When I come to the table of the Lord, I'm coming to the champion of my salvation. Amen. I'm coming to the one who paid the price for me. I'm coming to the one who gave his life for me. I'm coming for the one who spread his garment over me when I was sinful and came to him. I'm coming to the one who gave his very life that I might live. He's my Lord. He is my conqueror. And at the table we must remember this truth. It is finished. And allow it to charge our faith to believe for every need we have or circumstance we face. Let me say that again. When we come to the table of the Lord with this truth in our heart that it is finished, it must charge our faith. It must embolden our faith to believe for every need to, we have or every circumstance we face. Amen. So I really believe God is calling us to a new level of faith. Amen. I love that text that the speaker used this morning. And, and we had lunch together afterwards and I said, I, I want to draw your attention to your text. It is so simple and it is so, yet so powerful. Jesus said, and I want you to get a picture. He's, he's nonchalantly standing with the disciples. And he simply says, have faith in God. 
There was no great prelude. There was no great uh, introduction. There was no great theological statement. There was no great uh, theological theological context. He simply said, have faith in God. How simple can it be? And that's what this is all about. That we walk in faith in God who loved us and cared for us. And, and we've seen so much of God's good hand in the last few weeks as we've just walked in faith with God. You see, the table is a table of witness reminding people that God's grace excludes none. All are included. If there were any exclusion, I would have been excluded. I know what it's like to be picked as the last one on the, on, on the baseball team. I know what it's like to be picked as the last one on the hockey team. I stand there, I'm almost low, and some folks would look at me and say, well, we've got to invite him to come along because it's too obvious that we ignore him. So I have felt on occasion the pain of exclusion. I don't know if there's any of you here like that. I felt that as a boy to be the last one to pick. I know he really didn't want me. I know what that's like. But I want you to know something. The table says that none are excluded. Amen. Amen. I don't care how bad a player I am, how rotten I am, how sinful I am. When I come to the table of the Lord, I recognize that the tablecloth of God's grace in Christ Jesus covers my crippledness and my brokenness. Amen. Amen. And I am counted as one in the family of God. You are counted as one in the family of God. No matter what your background is. No matter where you come from. So the incredible truth of this here is that none is excused. You see the table is a harvest time celebration. Jesus said to us come for all things are ready. Then he said go out and compel them to come in. Isn't that great? Come and participate and then go out and tell and compel people to come in. But, 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 but Lord, they don't look like us. They're a different color than us. Uh, we speak a different language. We came from a different background. We do things differently. Is it okay, Lord? He said, tell them. Don't just tell them, bring them, drag them, compel them to come in. Amen. Because he's building his church. That's the message of the community. It's the most united place in the house of God. His word is clear. Who shall ever will may come. The table of the Lord is spread with peace, spiritual rest, release of guilt, forgiveness, and hope. What a place. That's where I want to be today. I want to be where there is the release of guilt. I want to be where there is spiritual rest. I want to be where there is peace. I want to be where there is forgiveness and hope. I want to be at the Lord's table. And notice what I just said. It's not my table. It's not the table of pure Pentecostal. It's not the table of those who prepare it. It's the Lord's table. Isn't that interesting? And being the Lord's table, He is the one who has provided this feast. It's a feast of eternal life, forgiveness, and reconciliation. I don't know where you are tonight in your relationship with God. I don't know where you are. You may be here and you're not even a believer. You're not even a Christian. You ever walked in the way that God has called you to go do that. I don't know where you are. I just know that the table is available for all who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of you here tonight might say, Pastor, that sounds so wonderful. I've never been at the Lord's table. I've never stopped, 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 found myself or thought myself worthy or acceptable. I thought I was excluded. You're only excluded if you choose not to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Paul would go on to write about how important it is that we have our hearts right with God before we partake of this. Then we come with reverence to receive, remembering, and being reminded of the truths that I've shared with that. There are many others. But the communion table is more than just a wooden bench and fancy dishes. It is a call for us to remember the powerful truth of salvation. Amen. The freedom and the liberty that comes when we make Jesus Christ our Lord. Is that something else as well? It's a call to discipleship. It's a call that says, Lord, 
I, I share this, I partake of this, but Lord, I am your disciple and I'm going to follow you. This is for those who follow Jesus. It's for those who have their hearts set. It says, Lord, I want you to be my 